So, I'm Nick Patch, and I work at Shutterstock on the international team, where we internationalize and localize our web applications and services. I'm also a member of the Unicode Consortium, and I've done a lot of talks in the past, including here, about Unicode and about characters. And everyone, you know, when they think about Unicode, they think about characters. Lots and lots of characters in all different languages. Egyptian hieroglyphics, for example. I emoji as well. All sorts of things. I've got no idea what the UC event is for. I, I mean, these. You must turn on your microphone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Should I start over, or do I? Up to you, depending on how wiggly you are with time. Well, as I was saying, I, everyone thinks about characters with Unicode. There are characters for written languages, there are characters for specifically for text messaging, like with emoji. Um, and there are a lot of algorithms and tools for working with these characters. For example, there are different normalization forms. So we take this letter G in one form and normalize it to just a general G, where you can compare your G letters in the same form. Or uh, this Arabic character, which is actually a ligature. And when you normalize it, it normalizes into the two separate characters. And there are all sorts of uh, different uh, normalization rules, but these are just some of the many things you can do to work on the character level. There are a lot of Unicode standards for working on the character level, normalizing, sorting, um, and you know, breaking uh, strings into characters, words, sentences, and so forth. What I'm here to talk about today is the Unicode CLDR. This stands for Common Locale Data Repository. This is like your traditional POSIX locales that you see on Unix and Linux systems, but on steroids. This is a massive specification with a massive amount of data for working with uh, pieces of language data uh, that you would use in, say, user interfaces. Uh, whether you're making a web application or a mobile application, and you want to uh, provide this app in a different language or in different countries, there's more than just translations. There's also formatting your numbers, your dates, your times, uh, even sorting different words in a localized way. And that's what this CLDR provides, both the data to, uh, for this and a specification for how to work with this data. I, and to clarify on what internationalization is versus localization, internationalization is writing software that can be localized. So I could write an application that is internationalized. I, I am able to work with translations in multiple languages and format in all different locales but it could be localized to just English. I've got this English-only application that is internationalized because it has potential. You're able to work with it to add additional locales. Or I could have a static website, and I could just copy that five times, translate each one to four different additional languages. Well, I've got my localized site into five locales, I, but it's not internationalized, because it's pretty hard to add an additional locale after that. So, with the CLDR, you can create an application that is internationalized, and you can easily localize from there. And at Shutterstock, we support 20 different languages. We've got all different European languages, as well as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Thai, um, you know, Turkish, various Northern European languages, and each one brings new challenges. But with the CLDR, we have been able to release new languages much faster than we would have if we needed a translator to work on all of the formatting, as well as uh, UX designers to think more about how these languages have to be displayed. So a few examples. With Shutterstock, 
we carry stock photography, stock videos, other stock media, and we sell licenses to use uh, this content. And here is our product pricing page in English. I, but just translating the text on here would not be enough because as soon as we get over to uh, Italian here, we would want to use a dot for the thousand separator instead of a comma. And then the dollar sign, well, it would be more natural to put it after the price entirely. Then we switch it over to Russian here. And Russian, they don't use a dot, they don't use a comma for thousand separator, it's just a space. So here it's a non written space because, well, we don't want it to be two here and five, five, nine here. That just wouldn't make any sense. In general, with the CLDR data, when you see spaces, it's going to be non-breaking space. Similarly, you wouldn't want your currency symbol below the whole amount, unless that was a stylistic uh, decision. And here, I think we've got uh, Norwegian, where it would be more natural just to use the uh, USD currency code than the uh, sign, the dollar sign altogether. So. I'd like to show you some libraries for working with the CLDR. This is uh, primarily not to show these individual libraries whether and what language they're in. It's more just as an example, because at the end, I'll show a lot of different libraries and modules for different languages and which ones are the best to use. Uh, in the examples here, they'll either be in Perl or in Ruby. So uh, locales is a Perl CPAN module, and it's a pretty simple interface to uh, just static locale data. And a lot of the type of data you think of with traditional POSIX locales. So here we're just instantiating a new locales object with the FR for French locale. I am calling get language from code on the code EM for English, and it's returning the French name for English. Then there's git territory from code for US and it's returning the French name for US. I would say we had a language, or say we had a country drop down. Well, we could just take all of our supported countries that we want on the drop down, loop through them, and do git territory from code here and display that on your drop down. And it makes it very easy to I, drop this into a form. So I'm not going to get too much into that because it's all just lots of static data you can work with. Um, but let's, let's take a look at some interesting formatting you can also do. So Twitter CLDR is a project, obviously started by Twitter, to implement uh, the CLDR in Ruby and JavaScript, also with a specific node package. Um, so they all have similar interfaces. And let's take a look at Twitter CLDR for Ruby, where we require Twitter CLDR, and it actually adds methods onto uh, your core types here, like uh, date time. So we date time, now, localize to Japanese. Now, we call a two full s, to full string, to get the full Japanese format of this date time. And here's what we have. Uh, this includes uh, everything about the date, time, and time zone. But uh, who here knows Japanese? Nobody. <laughs> I, is anyone here familiar with uh, what Spanish looks like? Okay, we've got some more people a little more familiar with Spanish than Japanese. So I'm going to continue on with uh, some Spanish examples here. So there's the full uh, date time in Spanish. And there are a lot of different formats you can choose from for dates and times. This is the long format. In general, you probably aren't going to need full because there's a lot of information in there and it's a long string. Uh, with these line breaks here, I just added them in for the presentation. It's just one string, no new lines in there. Then there's a medium format, that might be a little more popular to use, as well as a short form. And although Twitter CLDR doesn't yet support it, there's even a, a more recent narrow form. The narrow form has been added 
for mobile devices because you've got such little real estate on there. Sometimes the narrow form is ambiguous, but you kind of need to squish as many characters as possible into a small device. Sort of like a T might be for Tuesday and for Thursday, but with context, it makes sense. Then I, in addition to these named formats for dates and times, like by long, full, short, narrow, there's also a very rich uh, formatting, by like sort of by formatting uh, code, where here we pass y, q, 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 I, two, I, two additional, and additional is just all sorts of additional formats. Y here means year, and I, they, all these cues, that means this format of the quarter. So this is the second quarter of 2014. Well, you'll see that we put the Y before the cues. So why does uh, 2014 come after? Well, it knows that you would not put the year before this in Spanish in, in this long form, so it does the right thing. It's very smart. It makes it hard to implement a CLDR library, but very handy to use as a programmer. And I, QQQ means the uh, short form of the quarter. So this is just like saying Q2 2014 in English. And you can even call localize just on numbers in Ruby. Here we're formatting 1234.5 in Spanish. Now I'm going to get out of the uh, Ruby module for a minute because there's a, it's, it's a very it's a quality project. There's a lot of great code in there, and I recommend using it with Ruby. Uh, one drawback of it is that most of the locales are just languages, whereas a locale can be a language and a country, like you could have Canadian French or Canadian English. It can also be a script, so you could have a traditional Chinese, or more specifically, Chinese in the traditional Chinese script, and you could have Chinese in the uh, simplified Chinese script, or Chinese in the simplified Chinese uh, script in Macau. Uh, so you can have a lot of data just in your locale code and right now, Twitter CLDR mainly supports just the language, other than a few examples like uh, British English it does support. It's something that I'd love to help and contribute there. I, in fact, I plan on it, but I also plan on working on a lot of CLDR projects. Okay. Uh, and, and my focus is with Perl because, well, at Shutterstock, in addition to other languages, we use a lot of Perl, especially on the international team. And we've been releasing a lot of open source projects uh, to CPAMP in Perl. One reason why we use Perl so much on International is that it has great Unicode support. In the core language, uh, out of any other programming language, it has the best Unicode support. And this is more on the character level and the regular expression level in the language. Uh, but it's behind many other languages as far as CLDR support goes. So we've been implementing uh, parts of the CLDR spec and releasing them as CPAN modules. CLDR number is one of them. And instead of one large monolithic project to implement the entire mass of CLDR, the goal here is to implement everything related to number formatting. It's a little easier to, to bite off a chunk of just number formatting instead of everything else. So here, let's instantiate a CLDR number object with our I Spanish locale. And request a decimal formatter. Then we are calling the format method on our number we've seen before, 1,234.5. 
and we get the same results that we saw on the Ruby example. But now let's do Mexican Spanish, ES-MX. Well, in Mexican Spanish, and a lot of Latin American Spanish, you would expect a decimal point for the decimal separator and a comma for the thousand separator instead of the reverse that you will find in European Spanish. And that's why it's so important to also support the full locales, including the country, because we're displaying this to our users in Mexico, and we want a very natural experience for them. Arabic, it uses an entirely different I have numbering system. It's still it's still decimal based, but I, you, the characters are entirely different. And sometimes you might want to have your thousand separator there. It's actually not quite as commonly used in Arabic. So if you didn't want it, this is there are a lot of uh, attributes that you I, on your decimal formatter, like um, let's see, primary grouping separator, where you could just uh, set that to zero or undefined and get rid of it altogether. In fact, I, the Chicago Manual of Style, they recommend when you have uh, four digits, you don't use a thousand separator. If you have five or more, you do use it. So you might want to make a wrapper around this to add a little more logic if you're following Chicago Manual of Style for uh, your formatting. Now here's something interesting. This is Bengali. Notice that we've got three digits and our thousand separator and then two digits and what's that? I, well, you can't really call it a thousand separator here. We have a primary grouping separator and a secondary grouping separator. We keep on adding numbers. It's the primary grouping separator is three digits. The secondary grouping separator is two digits. So everything after the primary one is two digits, two digits, two digits. Most languages from India will do this as their native uh, formatting of numbers. Yeah, we uh, submitted a uh, salary for a new developer from India, and uh, the, my boss said, oh wait, you took the comma of the wrong numbers. <laughs> it's funny. Then we've got the uh, percent formatter. A lot of people, even people who realize that you need to uh, format your or localize your numbers, don't realize that the percent sign is going to change under your feed as well in different locales. So let's format 0 0.05, which we're looking for 5% here. And this is in Turkish. Well, in Turkish, they just put it on the other side of the number. And I mean, Turkish uses the Latin script. It's left to right, but with the percent they'd expect it on the left side of your number. And in Arabic, um, it's an entirely different percent sign. This is a different character. And obviously, I mean, that is actually the number for five, but using Arabic, uh, or Eastern Arabic numerals instead of the Western Arabic numerals that we use in English and many uh, European-based languages. In French, well, they use the percent sign on the right side, but they put a space in between the number and the percent sign. So this just goes to show that it varies so much. Don't just format your number and tack on a percent sign. And if you do use per mil, um, well, there are formats for that as well, and they follow the percent formats. Currency formats, that's what I'm going to get into next, and this is even more important to format using your full locale, because different people would expect different currency signs in different countries, depending on what country or what currency that country uses. So first we're just going to start off with uh, US dollars in English, and with the CLDR, if you just have English, it does think as US English. So let's format 9.99, a very popular price around here. And as you'd expect, 9.99. Well, Canadian English, you couldn't just format it and get $9.99 if that was in US dollars. Remember, we already set this as US dollars. 
it's so important that you format it as US dollars, $9.99, so they know what they're getting into because this is a different price. And you always, always need to have a currency with your number. There is no way to format a value if you don't have both a number and a currency because there's no meaning to, to what amount it is. You can't just uh, say this is in uh, euros or this is in yen and if you're in that locale because that would be an entirely different price and you could be getting a very good deal or a very bad deal. So here's Canadian French. And then we switch the currency to CAD, Canadian dollars. And well, we just use, lose the US entirely and it doesn't have a CA there because this is what would be expected in Canada. And then I'm back to Bengali using Indian rupees um, and well, they've got an entirely different currency sign. Now, I, I'm implementing this. I've learned a lot of interesting sort of edge cases with formatting. And here's a, a fun one. I, the sprint that we released this into production at work. Well, on the end of every two week sprint, we've got demo day on our Friday. And we do a demo for anyone in the company who wants to join. I, so I was showing this off in Swedish. And I was like, well, in Swedish, they use the comma for their decimal separator. But if it is a new, if it is a price, then they use a colon instead. I, and everyone, they turned to the Swedish guy at my work, and they're like, is this true? And he said, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of times, you'll want to take a formatted, I would say a formatted number, formatted price, and put that into a translated string. Because I, with translation systems, whether it's get text, make text, I, an in-house translation system, I know Ruby, has, Ruby, especially Ruby on Rails, has its own translation system. Um, here, instead of getting into any of those, because that's beyond the scope of the CLDR, uh, we're going to just have some pseudocode here, where we've got the translate function, and you pass to it first your English string with placeholder values. Here we have three placeholder values. So this is something to something of something. And we're going to use this in the case where we want 1 to 25, of 1,500. Well, you would commonly want something like this for search results. And the formatting of the numbers would change. And remember that this I, makes it so that you don't have to think about number formatting with your translations, especially since in Shutterstock, well, we support French. But or a better example, we, we support Spanish. We don't do separate translations for Mexican Spanish and European Spanish. I, that would just be, it would cost a lot more for translators. Well, fortunately, we can pass in our formatted numbers as placeholders. So we don't translate any numbers when we get our strings translated. We leave those as placeholders. We leave by any sort of dates, times, numbers, values as placeholders and format them on the fly and interpolate them you know, into our placeholders. There's a shortcut you can do with this example, though, because there's actually a range formatter, since the character you use for your range can even change in different locales. So we simplify this a little by having something of something, and we pass in our formatted range, 1 through 25. Let's take a look if we switch this to Japanese. Here we have a full width tilde being used as the range instead of an end dash. And you can even change the numbering system from the default one for the locale. So with Japanese, we use your standard ASCII Western digits by default with the CLDR. But say you want full width ones, we change the numbering system to full wide. 
And you could even change this to tie if you wanted to display tie digits, but I don't know why you'd want to do that unless you were using traditional tie. I, there, there's even an extension to the uh, language codes where after the last part of your traditional language code, whether it's the language, script, or country, you do dash, u, dash, and that says everything after here is Unicode extended language codes. I, and then it's key value pairs, NU for numbering system, full Y, the name of the numbering system. You're going to find less modules and libraries out there that support this full format. I, I built it into CLDR number, but you look at the documentation for your library to see if that's supported first. Now, I mentioned before that the sort order can even change. You've got the same strings, say they're all in German, I, but if you're sorting them in different locales, they would expect uh, to have a different sort order for some characters. Uh, here's an example. O with umlaut, as it would be called. Umlaut it would be called in German, the dot dot above it. Or uh, diuresis uh, is a more neutral term because it's not German. I, I guess if you were uh, using it in spinal tap, you could say rock dots. Um, but in German, there are even a couple different ways that they sort it. Sometimes it is uh, in the same place as OE. So essentially it would be equivalent to OE. Other times, uh, it would be right after the O. You'll see differences based in the phone book sort order or the dictionary sort order, and there are ways to specify that. But many Northern European languages also have the same character, and they would expect it to be after Z. It's not next to the regular O whatsoever. So that's why it would be important to sort and compare characters using a localized collator. Here, for example, we've got Unicode Collate Locale, which is bundled with uh, Corporal. And we instantiate our Unicode Collate Locale object with our uh, Polish locale here. And we just pass our uh, list or array of uh, words to the sort method, and it returns back the sorted list. I, I've got a GitHub project called Unicode Programming. Um, I'll, I'll tweet it out after this since I didn't include it on my slides, but it includes examples of doing just this uh, thing in many different programming languages and many other Unicode uh, functionality in Ruby, Go, all different languages. So for the ICU, ICU for C, which is available in C and C++, is like the very best implementation of the CLDR. It stands for Internationalization Components for Unicode. That, it really supports everything you could possibly want to do with the CLDR, as well as a lot of other Unicode functionality, like Unicode regular expressions. Uh, then there's ICU for J. It's really the same thing for Java, minus the regular expressions, because Java has actually pretty good Unicode regular expressions in the core language as of uh, Java 7. For, as I mentioned before, for JavaScript, Node, and Ruby, we've got Twitter CLDR. The Ruby version is the most complete implementation out of all of them. Uh, and for Perl, we've got a variety of CPAN modules, even some that are bundled with the core, like the collation one. In fact, I started I, this group, Perl CLDR, on GitHub and Twitter, just to organize CLDR work and update, say, the popular date time and date time locale module, as well as release new ones like CLDR number. And a lot of languages, they say, we're not gonna re-implement, all of this massive spec, let's just write wrappers around ICU for C. So with Python, Pi ICU is a wrapper around ICU for C. It has almost the same interface. I, a few tweaks to make it a little Python-y, but the goal was to have the same API so that you can read the ICU docs and understand it without having to write them all over again for Python. And in the documentation, it lists just any differences from the regular ICU for C interface. I, 
Then for PHP, if you're using PHP 5.3 or later, you're in luck because the International Library is bundled now with PHP Core as of 5.3. It's a wrapper around some parts of the ICU. You don't get uh, quite everything, but a lot of the important stuff with number formatters and with uh, common locale data. Then uh, Haskell, it has text ICU, another ICU for C wrapper. And if you go to uh, this URL here, on the ICU project, it will list all sorts of other ones for other projects. These are the most mature. I've seen a lot of ones that haven't been updated in years. Perl actually had one from about a decade ago, and Ruby has a wrapper from about four years ago, but they, they aren't being maintained, so they're not getting new updates, they're not compatible with newer versions of the ICU. So, any questions? What about C-sharp? I know it has a lot of functionality kind of built in, but not everything. So with C-sharp, that's an interesting question because traditionally with .NET, I, you've got this built-in localization system where they don't refer to them as locales, they refer to them as cultures. And it is a, a, a Microsoft project that up until recently, most people working with .NET would just use that. But now Microsoft has joined the Unicode Consortium, and they are working with the CLDR. I, I think it's kind of obvious that the CLDR is the future of locale data. I, and so many companies are jumping on board, I, from IBM to Microsoft. You've got lots of I, organizations like Wikimedia, all sorts of open source projects and languages, as I've shown you. I, and I think you know, there was one point in time where not everyone was convinced that Unicode and UTF-8 was the way to go, but now we're kind of, you know, we've, it's been a little while now that we've been all on board. Now people are I, beginning to all come on board for the CLDR. I, one thing I would recommend is that if you want to get into C, help out with the CLDR and there's not much, uh, enough data for the language that you want to support and you're a native speaker of that language, is that you can request a CLDR um, editor account. And I've done this for Esperanto. I, I've helped some other people, two people now, I, for uh, Filipino and Tagalog. And it's I, pretty simple to request an account. You are able to add any locale data that doesn't already exist. And any member of the Unicode, uh, any Unicode member or anyone with an account is able to vote on them. Uh, if you are a full Unicode member, then you have uh, a stronger voting rights than somebody who just signs up as an individual who knows a language. But still, it can really help to both add new data that doesn't exist and to have discussions on the CLDR forum, which uh, is a nice tool to I uh, work with all of this info and see which languages have uh, the uh, most activity. For example, Esperanto is at number 90, but that's because like, I added the 600 editions since the last version of the CLDR. Uh, so that can be a good direction if you don't have all the data you want. Of course, you have to wait for the next release of it, and the CLDR is on a major annual release where we've got version 25 now, 26 will be the next. Hi, uh, Andy? Um, do you know much about uh how, how well HTML uh, would, would support these kind of things. An, an example being, um, I know there's like uh, HTML form field types for decimals um, that validate, uh, you know, whether it is a legal decimal to X number of places. Uh, but if I were making a form that was to accept international currencies, uh, I'd want to be able to accept comma, um, the colon is Sweden apparently, uh, do you know much about the support for that? Well, I think you'd have to do a different way of validation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the CLDR actually specifies parsing for numbers as well as formatting, but less library supported. The ICU-based ones do, and you could use that to see if it, you can actually parse it. I, or, 
it, it gets so complex because they're so different with different locales. So that would be the main way to go. You'd have to though do a server request in order to, to do it. It'd be hard right, to do right. that on the client side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And we actually we had one question over uh, here. This, what's the size of the, the data set? Right. Okay, so I, the CLDR25 is distributed in XML in a specific XML format called the LDML, uh, locale data such and such. I, the version 25, just the core data is 26 megs. Um, but you can generate a lot more data out of that if you, in some libraries, do that. So it can get much larger. Some libraries will load up all of the data for you. Other ones uh, are more compartmentalized per locale or per functionality. I, in the pro route that I've been going is compartmentalize it into individual modules because parts of the CLDR say how you uh, transform text from one script into another, like hiragana to katakana and back, or Latin, using any Unicode characters that are Latin based to ASCII, and these are standardized ways to do it. With that, I might want, I uh, say, to use that in a search related, a light search related service at work. But I don't want all the locale data. I don't want to load that all up. So I prefer to just use that. Or with uh, text segmentation. It specifies localized text segmentation on all different levels. And you might want to use that for search related purposes, but not any of the other locale data. And I have a question in the back, and then we'll get here. Um, I, I was also curious about like the uh, how much of this is machine readable versus uh, just prose and spec. Uh, like, can you just load up the XML and like, like, like how how much uh, um, prose do you have to translate into code to create an implementation? And it's a very well, it's a con the, it's a complex XML data structure. Uh, you need you need to understand the LDML for that. But fortunately, there's a command line tool uh, to convert it to JSON. I uh, and with that, it's the the goal isn't to take all of the data and convert it to JSON. There are uh, command line options just for what parts of it you want. I uh, and you could say just these locales, or you can say all the locales, but just for this data. Uh, Jesse? So the Perl modules you're writing, do those map CD for C, or? Those are pure Perl modules where I am taking the XML data, and I am just taking exactly what I need, you know, I write a script to do this, and to plop it into a Perl data structure that is used for by the Perl module. What's the advantage of that over wrapping the C implementation? The advantage is that I'm not a C programmer. So if somebody, I, I think if, as a language community, we do need a full wrapper for ICU for C. Uh, but somebody else has to step up to do that. And I'd be happy to help out in the ways I can. Uh, cool. So I'll just comment, there is a, um, it is very deep, like there is a, a coalition module in all. For IC, um, you can put IC call it for those are interested. Um, it's good for collation. It has a little bit of like language names. It doesn't have much of this number of stuff. But for people who are interested in in the Perl side of things, that doesn't exist. It's like 0 0.02 right now. But. Yeah, he brings up a good point. I, I Unicode ICU collate is actually a wraparound ICU for C just for collation. As I showed before, we've also got Unicode Collate Locale, which is also C-based, but it was implemented specifically for Perl. Uh, and it can be faster based on the fact that uh, it natively uses UTF-8, whereas ICU natively uses UTF-16. So you don't have to convert from UTF-8 to UTF-16 going in, and then convert back going out. That's one reason that a lot of people in the Perl community haven't been as into ICU for C, just because uh, natively UTF-16, and it would work out better in, say, Python. Right, because the trend, the, the, the um, decoding and encoding is quite sensitive, actually. Uh, uh, two, uh, two quick questions. So it sounds like ICU is like a reference implementation of one. Is it created by? Yes, so traditionally it really is considered as a reference implementation. Now they're, they're, I, they have made an effort to move over to the actual I, CLDR, LDML spec as being the 
you know, the official reference for it, because it, it used to be that there were actually references to ICU saying, you know, the way that it was. ICU is the most complete, it's, you know, officially sanctioned, and it uh, is where I'd recommend looking at if you were to implement CLDR functionality. But one thing I should mention is that you don't always need a library for this. Sometimes you might actually want to just take the data you need and put it in your application. For example, I, there is localized yes and no, and Y and N. Say you have an IO prompt, and you want to be able to say, you know, in Spanish, like S and N, I, that's an example where you, it's very lightweight functionality with very little data needed, and I would say, I don't want to call ICU for that, but I can just grab the data I need and build it right into my library. And the, the other question uh, is, um, it seems like there's, there's just a huge amount of functionality here, and knowing what's available, for you, I mean, you can't really get a firm grip on that just by looking at the spec. I mean, unless you spend a lot of time, uh, and uh, um, there are a few programmers like you that have spent a great deal of time. So it's a domain specialty that just a few people have, and I'm just wondering about whether there are curriculum materials uh, available for, for learning about like in-depth internationalization if you wanted to pursue that as a specialty. Are you aware of any programs or any like open curriculum materials? Or? There's way too little information yeah. out there, I, I, in my opinion. This is becoming a more popular career path, in fact, internationalization and localization. I have more people are hiring people uh, just for that. We're getting more and more companies with teams just for that, but it's very early on, and there just aren't many books out there and resources out there, especially good ones, up-to-date ones. Everything's changing so quickly. There's not much good documentation for the CLDR out there. It's a pain to read the spec, and uh, oftentimes the modules aren't I, well enough documented, but I think that's because we're at a very early time as far as you know companies and libraries supporting this, and it's exciting just you know using it and being a part of it right now. Uh, so, are there any bloggers that we recommend? And also, um, it, it would be really cool if there was a massive online course. That's what I was kind of getting at. Yeah, then it, it, maybe you should teach it for some reason. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, tend to, I, I tend to tweet about it at Nick Patch. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think about just like uh, bloggers that talk a lot about the CLDR. They, I don't see much of it out there. I see some Unicode bloggers that I can. I oftentimes I don't remember folks' names offhand for like the blogs I follow. I but there's this I, one guy in the JavaScript community who writes a lot of good blogs on Unicode in general, but that means nothing to you. So I, I'll, I'll follow you on Twitter. Yeah, so I, I definitely talk a lot about these things on, on Twitter. I'm going to post these slides on Twitter, as well as I think there's a resource to do that on the OS Bridge site. Uh, and I also I have a, a little more Perl-specific talk that I gave on Tuesday in Orlando, or Monday in Orlando at, at Yapsi North America. And the full video for that is already online. Um, so I, I have tweeted about that as well. I, and I'd be happy to answer anyone's questions for the rest of the conference, as well as just like online, on Twitter, or anywhere, because I love to talk about this stuff. Well, thanks, everyone.